Good morning. I want to welcome you to our online worship service at United Church of Sandwich. We have in-person worship each Sunday at 10 a.m. outside. You may come and bring your lawn chair and sit outside in the shade, or you can stay in your car in the parking lot with the radio tuned to our worship service. We're going to continue to worship outside in the foreseeable future, but we're going to worship together. If you are unable or are not comfortable yet coming in person, we will continue to have online worship. We invite you to click on the link in the description for our online attendance to let us know that you were able to join us today. You will also see the links for our online giving as we continue to meet the financial obligations of this church and, most importantly, the link to our website that gives you all the information about what's happening here in the life of Sandwich. We are, thank you for, we are thankful for you worshiping with us and now we invite you to be an attitude of praise and prayer as we begin our worship here together. Amen. Sun for bear to 
Please join me in the call to worship. You will re read the words on the screen. Brothers and sisters, boys and girls, come and worship. Even if you are tired and worn out, come and worship. Lay down the heavy things you are carrying, come and worship. Listen to what Jesus wants to tell you, come and worship. See if you can discover how Jesus wants to use you. Come and worship. For Jesus is humble and gentle, and he will give us everything we need to follow him. Let us pray. O oh God, we gather together in your presence with expectation, hungry for an encounter with you, eager to hear your word. Open your eyes and ears to the presence of your Holy Spirit. May the seeds of your word scattered among us this morning fall on fertile soil. May they take root in our hearts and lives and produce an abundant harvest of good words and deeds. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our teacher and our Lord. Amen. The scripture lesson today is from Genesis 37, verses 23 through 36. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty, there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for twenty shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, The boy isn't there. Where can I turn to now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of the Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
We are beginning our second week in plot twists as we look at the life of Joseph to see the twists and turns, zig and zags of his life and find the comparisons with the lives that we go through. Last week we saw a happy home from the outside but was deeply fractured and troubled from the inside. And like termite, termites going through a house eating the wood, the sin and attitudes of Jacob, of Joseph and the brothers were eating away at the foundation of that family. Well, the foundation cracked and broke apart right here. This past week, we had some serious storms go through our area. And our youngest, she found comfort in being close to us during the worst of the storm. And all our kids, when they were young, felt better when they were around us during the lightning and the thunder and the rain. It's scary when bad things happen, when you find yourself in a dark pit lost, alone. Oftentimes in life, when that happens to us, we find ourselves asking, has God abandoned us? Does God care about us? He has not. He does care about us. But we need to look at Joseph's story to see the way that God works and understand how God is with us and the choices that we make. It starts in Genesis 37. We find that Joseph is with his father Jacob and all the other brothers are far enough away as shepherds that they can't just quickly go to them. They have traveled pretty far. It's interesting here that Joseph is the only brother, the only boy who is not working. Again, we see Jacob's favoritism towards Joseph. So he sends his son out. Go send, the, send your brothers a message. And Jacob, uh, Joseph goes. He gets to the spot where they're supposed to be and they're not there. But he finds out from someone that they've moved to another town. So go there. And as Joseph is traveling... We don't know what type of spectacle he's making or, or exactly what's happening, but the brothers can spot it's him before he's even close. They have enough time to conspire. Their, their envy, their jealousy, their resentment, their hurt for Jacob's actions towards Joseph and Joseph's actions towards his brother, that is literally eaten away at their morality. Let's, let's kill him. Let's kill him, throw him in a pit, and be done with it. They have enough time to develop a, a murder plan before Joseph even makes it to him. The oldest brother, Reuben, we can see him looking, trying to, without going against his brothers, look after Joseph and alters the plan and say, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in a pit. And we read in the scripture that Reuben's plan all along was to get Joseph back to his father safely. So they capture him. Can you imagine, imagine the shock of arriving to family, to your brothers, to, to people you trusted, and they react to you immediately by capturing you, tying you up, and throwing you into a cistern, a, a well, a dried up well. And he's down there. We don't know how long. It's so long enough for them to decide to have a meal. Reuben has disappeared. And the thoughts of killing Joseph has creeped back up among the brothers. At this point, Judah here is another one who decides, let's not kill him. They see uh, traveling Ishmaelites. Let's sell him into slavery. Judah's plan is to spare 
Joseph's life while getting rid of him at the same time. And just like that, Joseph is a slave, gone from being the favored son of an anointed family by God into being a slave of foreigners, heading who knows where. He's fallen far. He's literally in a pit, and then metaphorically in a pit. And we know it's bad because in Genesis 42, 21, the brothers respond when they reunite with Joseph years, years later, they write, they say to one another, Surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when we pleaded with, his, with us for his life, but we would not listen. The Hebrew term there, distress, refers to not just physical, but actual emotional. They recall years, years later, Joseph begging them, to stop while they sold him into slavery. What do you do when you've been betrayed, hurt, abandoned? When you feel that like God's not there anymore? How do we go forward holding on to that cornerstone Obviously, we see in here a, a picture of how far humanity can go. That even the people who are close to us, people that we put trust in or love and that we think support us, can turn on us. Not always, and hopefully it's rare, but we are all capable of sin. And when we allow that sin to fester in our hearts, it can develop and grow into deep pain. And we see how sin can corrupt because even Reuben, with a good intention of trying to look after Joseph, still travels a path of sin and throwing him into a pit instead of stopping his brother's actions in the track and taking charge as the oldest. He becomes complicit. So much so that when he tries to retrieve Joseph and finds the pit empty and sees the bloody clothes, tears his own clothes in regret and grief. We see Judah trying to have good intentions and sparing Joseph's life's life still because of his sin, heads down a path of corruption in selling him into slavery. Yes, we can see very clearly the effect of sin and what human nature can do apart from God. But when we look in Joseph's side, we ask the question, has God abandoned us? We can see a clear answer. When we are in a pit, when we are in pain, when we are hurting, when we have been hurt, Genesis 39.2 says, the Lord was with Joseph. Genesis 39.3 says, the Lord was with Joseph. 39.21, the Lord was with Joseph. Genesis 39.23, the Lord was with Joseph. Throughout this entire action, we don't need to ask if God had abandoned Joseph because God repeatedly and clearly says, I am with you. Many of us know the Psalm 23. As I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You anoint my head with oil and you protect me in the presence of my enemy, my cup overflows we see very clearly that 
the Lord is with us, the Lord will protect us, the Lord will anoint us, and the Lord will provide for us, but it never says the Lord will not let, make us go into that valley. Because of the brother's actions, Joseph was forced into a valley of pain and abandonment and despair, of hopelessness, that was decided by the brothers. But in all of it, God said, I will not abandon you. I will be with you. doesn't matter where we have to go. God is never going to say, I will only go with you for so far. God would go anywhere. Psalm 139 says, where can I go that I can escape God? If I go to the east or to the west, God is there. If I go to heaven, God is there. If I go to Sheol, if I go to hell, God is there. God will literally go to hell to be with us. Jesus, on his life, it's the very definition that God would go anywhere to be with us in our pain. Including letting go of all the majesty and glory that is God to become a man and to die for us so that he could rise for us. But even Jesus had a moment where he had to ask, have you abandoned me, God? In his lowest moment, when he was in pain, when he had been betrayed, just like Joseph had, when Judah sells Joseph for 20 coins, when Judah sells Jesus for 30 coins, we can see that betrayal, that abandonment, that loneliness, and asking God, where are you? Jesus utters the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eloi, Eloi, lama sekbaktini. He wasn't making that line up. In fact, on the cross, you died by asphyxiation and he could barely breathe, let alone speak. So he could get out just that first line, but he was actually quoting not Psalm 23 that we just talked about, about God walking with us through the valley, but Psalm 22, the psalm that comes right beforehand. When it begins, this is a psalm of David, when David is being hunted. And in David's trial of his life as a young man, David writes, Psalm 22, 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Sound familiar? Let's continue. Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, but I will find no rest. Yet, you see right here, David, in his struggles when he's being hunted by the King Saul, is asking, God, are you with me? Did you leave me? Joseph is feeling that right now. And even Jesus on the cross is speaking this sentiment. And yet, on the cross, Jesus in his heart is continuing Psalm 22 because, verse 4, verse 3, Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel in you, our ancestors put their trust. David speaking partially about Joseph right now. They trusted you and you delivered them. They cried to you and, you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. Jesus on the cross speaks out a psalm in his darkest time, remembering the hope that David had that when his darkest time, asking if he was abandoned, David spoke of the same hope that God was with him about Joseph of his darkest time, asking God, are you with me? And God saying four times, the Lord was with him. When we feel lost or abandoned or betrayed, that is the precise moment, most of all, when God is with us. 
it does not mean we do not go through the hardship. It does not mean the hurt and pain is any less. It does not mean our heart is not broken. But it means that our broken heart is shared with God's broken heart. That our lost is found at home with God. That where we go, God goes. Many of you have experienced hurt in your life. And I tell you, no. In those moments, God was holding you up. And I want you to know that because if you're experiencing hurt right now, or if you're on a path, there could be loneliness and hurt and abandonment and betrayal in your, in your journey. But never lose hope because the Lord is with you. Joseph's story here sees that even in the darkest days, God will walk with us. Our answer, our choice is not whether or not to accept it because he's going to be there no matter what. It's on our actions. And here's where the second story we find is it's not on God. God is God never changes. God is always going to give his most God's fullest for us, especially in our hardest days. The question we have to ask is what is our response going to be? And I, I find it fascinating. If you look at Genesis 39 two, again, it says in 39 two, the Lord was with Joseph, but it also continues on and says, Joseph became a successful man. Joseph was faithful. Now, this does not describe the 17-year-old kid that we had talked about last week, the one that would tattle on his brothers, the one that would parade his nice coat around to show, the one who was prideful and arrogant. This was a humble person, a faithful person. But we can assume, based on his actions and his attitude, that in the pit and in slavery, when he had been distressed, when what he had put his foundation on, his family, had crumbled, he had found a new foundation in God, and that reshaped him. We can only have control over our actions. And the question is going to be when we are going through that valley or that struggle or that trial or tribulation, are we going to lash out the way the brothers did in their trial to become bitter, angry, resentful, to let heart take control of their lives? Or do we accept that God is with us? And let that relationship with God, no matter how dark it is on the outside, shine a light on who we are and on our heart. And so the Lord was with Joseph and Joseph was faithful and honorable. And because of that, Joseph was successful. And God is taking bad and turning it into good. And we're going to talk about that in the next few weeks. But Joseph decided to let his actions be determined not by the content, context of his life, but by the relationship with his God. The brothers, on the other hand, in this point in their life, they go in the opposite direction. Not only do they let hate fester in their heart, they, they attempt to conspire to kill Joseph, they throw him in the pit, they sell him into slavery, but the one thing that they were not expecting was the pain that they would cause their father. When Jacob finds out he's inconsolable, he weeps for days. He mourns for days. It says all his sons and all his daughters try to comfort him and no one could. Could you imagine? You are the cause of the pain and you are trying to comfort the person. They had intended to harm Joseph. They never realized their actions would harm another as well. 
But in selling Joseph into slavery, they have to come up with some plan. They don't kill him physically, but they decide, let's lie. Let's, let's kill, let's, let's tell our father we, he was killed by a lion. They even show the robe, which I'm, I'm, I can only imagine causes more pain. If they had been honest with their father, the pain would have been immense. But Joseph, Jacob, would have known Joseph was alive. Could have had hope. But they have to keep the lie going. A lie is like an inverted pyramid. And you're trying to prop that pyramid up and every lie just adds weight to the top, creating it more and more structurally unsafe. So by in lying and saying Joseph is dead, they cause more pain on their father than by telling them the truth and owning up to their actions. Both Joseph and the brothers each both committed mistakes. They both sinned. The brothers and their low point let that sin corrupt them, turn them. Joseph let his low point redeem him, rise him up. Right now, there's a lot of anxiety and pain and struggle in this world. You can say it with the pandemic, you can say it with politics, you can say it with culture and social media, the way we treat each other. And what's clear is that the adversity that we face as a society drags us down, turns us into people that we might not have recognized, or the adversity builds us up because we take the strength of God to overcome. What are you going to let the adversity of your life do? Drag you down or build you up? The low point for Joseph became a rebirth. The low point in our lives can be a rebirth. But it begins by remembering four things. The Lord is with us. 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 Go out into this world knowing you are not abandoned. You are loved. You are cared for. And you are watched over. With that knowledge, let your relationship define your life. Amen.